Jane Fallon is a singer-songwriter from New Hampshire who is an award-winning veteran performer of original songs and some cover songs, too. She recently finished her fifth CD of original music titled Tangled in a Tree, which was nominated by Limelight Magazine as CD of the Year called Powerful, Inspirational, Uplifting, and Impressive. And I just asked Jane, I don't know what she's performing today, but I clipped a few of the lyrics of that song. The old man on the sidewalk asking for my change cannot meet my eyes talking kind of strange. I empty out my pockets, give him what I can. I've got bills, a bank account that's thin, but I'm in better shape than the shape he's in. We're only here a moment, so it seems like shadow puppets in somebody's dreams. Dance out of the darkness, dance into the light. You only get one chance, so do it right. And that gives you an idea of a number of the songs that Jane has written and shared with her audiences, uh, not only in Massachusetts, but across the country. And as she continues to write her songs about many different aspects of life, uh, she also zeroes in on what matters in looking after one another. She looks after uh, others through the lyrics of her songs. She cares for us and the world. And consequently, she has been nominated and awarded uh, different songwriting awards dealing with environmentalism, uh, dealing with uh, different themes of social uh, consciousness uh, of women's rights, um, of uh, human welfare here, and as far as uh, the other side of the world in Africa, dealing with AIDS epidemics. Um, you will get to hear a sample of Jane's songs uh, today, and then she also has five CDs that you can take a look at in the back afterwards. So I will let her song speak for themselves, and also that we'll have a little bit of uh, hearing from Jane as well. Uh, Jane also is a professor of English in the New Hampshire area, so we will get to have her as a little bit of teacher and uh, in source of inspiration. So please help me welcome Jane Fallon. Well, this is an honor. I've been here several times. I think I featured here once before. And it's such a wonderful, warm space. And I really am delighted to have you know, followed. It's hard to follow that man, but Fred Marchand is very, very nice listening to his, or I got to plug in, in his music, and his music, his poetry. And uh, songwriting, of course, is poetry of a different sense, and often we're constricted more by form, time limits, and those kinds of things. I thought I would limit a little bit today on the, the narrative. I just wrote a book called Beyond Reason, Songwriting on Purpose, which comes from a uh, year to teach in college composition. And there are forms of rhetoric we always adhere to, right? And we teach our students. And I found if I brought the guitar in, they just loved hearing me give an example with song of what they were going to write. And I realized, I wish I could sing, teach this whole freaking class with just the guitar. <laughs> it would be so, so much better. But the, the rhetoric, the tropes, all the same. So I want to start with one that I wrote for a contest. I consider contests to be uh, prompts on steroids because you're getting a prompt, you're getting things you have to write about, but then you get to go perform this someplace in front of a built-in audience in a different part of the country or the world. And um, this one, I looked for a song about Florida, and it hit me between the eyes. I said, wow, no one's written a folk song about this, the second worst racial incident in our history. And um, I'm also going to talk about person and persona. Uh, first person is, of course, very, very much used in narrative. And for most of us uh, um, songwriters, we don't want it to be about me. And that gets boring after all, at least for me. I'd, you'd be boring here about me all the time. Um, but not only I in this song, but persona. The first line that came to my head when I saw the story about this was, my name is Fanny Taylor. My name is Fanny Taylor, and in 1923 I lived next to a sawmill northeast of Cedar Key in the little town of Sumner, 
divided by race from the nearby town of Rosewood such a peaceful place before the fire before the noise before I heard the sheriff call oh let's go get him boys before the death before the screams I walk the streets of Rosewood in my A hundred angry men sent their dogs into the night to find one black man that they said attacked a woman who was white. And they tortured and they killed and they terrorized the town and they took their torches with them. They burnt it to the ground. The rosewood I remember was a happy place to be with three churches and two schools and a baseball team and houses always painted and roses everywhere and at night piano music filled the air before the fire the south it was a hotbed of violence those years there were lynchings, there were riots, hearts and minds filled with prejudice and fear, but you cannot blame me. My husband went to work very early every day, and he came home very late at night. I so had a lover he came to my back door one day he hit me with all his might to tell the truth about those bruises would have led to my disgrace so I said what came the quickest to my tongue that it was a black man who hit me in the face so God forgive me I was young before the fire, before the noise, before I heard the sheriff call, oh, let's go get him boys, before the death, before the screams, I walk the streets of Rosewood in my dreams. One day it was a place where children went to school the next I saw it burn before my eyes once upon a time a community with pride before the fire before my life thank you So I went down to Florida and um, won first place in a contest down there with McLean. And um, it was so nice to be welcomed telling someone else's story. I'm a Yankee. What am I doing coming into Florida? But it, it took time and it took someone from the outside to tell this story. And the only poetic license I really took that I couldn't find by research was I don't know what went inside her heart. I have no idea if she had guilt or not. But it made sense to me. You, you say what's expedient or else I'm going to, you know, my, divorce, my, my husband's going to divorce me. Or, and then, my God, what did I just start? So that was where it came from. So when I go into the, researching these things, I love this task, task-oriented, I guess. And I wrote this next one. It's an environmental aspect to a song for a competition out in Washington State, um, maritime music competition. And it happens every year, Puget Sound. And the theme was then and now. And of course, try to write it about the Puget Sound and around the Pacific. So I start doing my research. I wanted to find a real story, you know, a family that had lost their fishing business, you know, couldn't find one. So I made my own. And again, this is first person. But instead of a narrative with a plot, it's three examples that move us from 
uh, one era to the next. And I did my research, and coming from Pacific Northwest, I knew a little bit about it. I mentioned Cherry Point. I mean, the Cherry Point herring was world famous. And I mentioned you know, Discovery Bay, and I mentioned Bellingham, Washington, which is where there's a, you know, a university. And uh, they liked it, and they gave me first place. Sometimes, and I went and played, it was great, but sometimes when you do too much research, you end up knowing more than the locals do. And one guy said, there haven't been herring here for years, you know, and a woman who talked to me, she said, well, the judges know, and said, is that actually, just last year, they're talking about herring at, at a town meeting. I looked, I found the town meeting, when it's, the Indians want to fish for herring, they're, they're there, there's just not enough of them. So um, it was a fun song to write, and I think any of us who live in endangered um, fishing areas, whether it's up in Maine or whatever, are going to hear something uh, that um, rings true about what's happening in our environment. My granddad was a sailor, he fished the Puget Sound, netting herring down at Cherry Point, fishing all around the inlets and the coast of Discovery Bay. He'd be out for months and then come back and say, the going out is harder than is the coming in, but I would have it any other way now I'm swimming upstream I'm fighting the tide the herrings disappearing from the sea it's hard to make a living doing what I love anymore I'm trimming my sails pulling up net heading ashore And in his time, my daddy made his living on the waters Enough to take a wife, care for his sons and daughters And for days he'd spend his time aboard his craft, the Annalee Trawling the Pacific, and one time he said to me There's danger on the water for a captain and his crew but son, there is no life like the life out on the sea. Now I'm swimming upstream. I'm fighting the tide. The herring's disappearing from the sea. It's hard to make a living doing what I love anymore. I'm trimming my sails, pulling up net, heading ashore. Is it the coal? Is it the oil? The overfishing? The warmer waters? Or the towns that change the shoreline? And the way the rivers flow that make the herrings smaller? Make them sick and make them die? No one's really sure they know. My son, he asked me, Daddy, can we catch the little fish? I sigh and shake my head and say all we can do is wish that those with all the power will do the best they can. And meanwhile, I'll go find myself a job in Bellingham. And I'll send you to college and dry dock the Annalee and hope again someday to be a seafaring man. But now I'm swimming upstream, I'm fighting the tide. The herring's disappearing from the sea. It's hard to make a living doing what I love anymore. I'm trimming my sails, I'm pulling up net. I'm heading ashore. I'm trimming my sails, pulling up net, heading ashore. Thank you. you. You look around for everything you can to give it uh, reality and be realistic about it and check, double check your facts and sometimes you do it right and sometimes you make a mistake. But uh, there was a video called Heading to Shore, so I grabbed that line. I liked it. And I put it in the song. And, uh, and it was fun to go out there. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, but I never went to that part of the coast. And it was an awesome thing. Um, 
Yeah, I do do songs in the first pe- person, but very seldom about me. This next song's first person, but it's from somebody's point of view without being persona. It's not putting myself in their, their play so much as telling their story. I'm not trying to get into their head as much, but saying this is, this is something someone would have said to something else. And in keeping with what Fred's themes were, this is about the Vietnam War. Uh, my brother Bill was a soldier, and he came back from the war totally destroyed. Uh, took him years to stop having nightmares, et cetera. And um, then he got cancer later in life, and um, it went virulent, and they think it was partly because of exacerbated by Agent Orange. He was in heavy, heavy spraying. Killed his body, brain, everything. And at the end of his life, he, he passed away, and, and one of his kids said, you know, Aunt Jane, I wanted to join the Army, and he just dropped me at the airport, and he just took off, and he was mad at me. And I said, well, let me sing you a song. Maybe you'll figure out why your dad did not want you to join the Army. He wanted you to go to college, not to join the Army. I've got a pick, I think, on this one, if it's in my pocket somewhere, which it is. There we go. The nightmares don't come often anymore. Don't wake up to cold sweats every night But I cannot forget all the horrors that I met Every murky Mekong Delta morning light I know that you'll do fine at Fort Jackson You're strong and you're smart and you're tough But why can't you see what you're doing's done to me? I have had enough The jaws of war that lurk beneath the depths of hatred's waters Took away my care for you Now they want my daughter I left you on the sidewalk at the airport Dropped your bag, slammed my door and drove away And I know that you were hurt and you were angry And I'm sorry for the things I couldn't say I know that I should stand there at the window And wave as the plane taxis away But I'd put that uniform back on, though it might bleed me dry If I could only make you stay The war machine that feeds on greed and serves up senseless slaughter Took away my care for you, now it wants my daughter They stole years from my life, they blew my soul apart They ate away my peace of mind Now they want my heart Now they want my daughter I fed you and I clothed you And I worked the daily grind To show you that I loved you Never meant to be unkind But you don't understand I can see it in your eyes Why I cannot take your hand and bid a fond goodbye It's just I'm so damned angry, partially at you But mostly at this wicked world and the things it wants to do Do they have so many bombs and guns they can kill and mess up all our sons But they also need my lovely one Must they take Thank you. <laughs> Bill was an unusual man. Uh, that daughter I spoke of was actually the daughter of my youngest sister, Deanna, who committed suicide when she was 23. Bill, Bill raised two kids of hers on his own. And not always an easy man and a tough man, but um, 
when he was, knew he was dying, he told my sister, he says, uh, anybody shows up on this doorstep with a folded flag in his hand, you spit in his eye. And there was no way he was being married, buried with military honors. No way. He was just not going to do it. He was so, so shaken and hurt by that whole experience. It just uh, destroyed his life. So that's one song with narrative trying to get inside of his skin without actually being there, telling what I heard from him, my sister tell me what he said. Um, move to something that's fictional, but is still first-person narrative. And how do we take the fictional and make it real? We use real details that we stick in. And this song's called My Daddy Was a Cowboy. And my dad was a cowboy. I grew up in a cattle ranch. But it's not about my daddy, really. It's about a little girl who doesn't know who her daddy is. But my daddy, boy, he was, he was John Wayne and Gary Cooper put together. So it's hard to not put him in this picture somehow. He had a um, little cigarette hanging out of his mouth all the time. Till, till his 50s and he quit, thank God. Sleeves were always rolled up three quarters. When you work with machinery all the time, those sleeves stay here, right? They don't, you have no watch, no rings, nothing. And um, when he was a young man in California, I was traveling with him that s several summers, and I wrote a book about it called Seven Songs in Seven Days, Journey of an Arkansas Cowboy. And uh, one of the stories was when he was a young man in California, Sacramento Valley, in his mid-20s, um, the rains came down, horrific. And the Sacramento River was really flowing. He was working in the rice fields. And the farmers said, we've called the Army Corps of Engineers, and they're not coming. Anybody lay some dynamite? And Daddy says, well, I reckon I can do that. So he and the buddy went out in the skiff and laid 10 charges along the uh, uh, dam in the Sacramento li River and blew it. Didn't totally make it, so they did it one more time. So that's kind of, those things are mentioned in this song. So even though this isn't about my daddy, this is the kind of daddy I think little girls who don't know who their daddy is want to have. On the outskirts of town in a single wide, just mama and me, and not much pride. Whenever they'd go into town, no one said, hey, they just look down. Didn't know why they turned away, but daddy was a cowboy, my daddy was a cowboy. They say Found the picture I was looking for Buried in the bottom of her underwear drawer Long and lean in a pickup truck Cigarette in his mouth and his sleeves rolled up Heard the door slam and I put it away Daddy was a cowboy my daddy was a cowboy, they say. No one told me how he died, it must have been some big. Maybe he died saving some young girl from a wild horse stampede. Or maybe the levee overflowed and threatened to bury the town. And daddy lit the fuse that saved them all just before he drowned. I guess it might have been that way. Cause daddy was a cowboy. My daddy was a cowboy, they say. In and out of trouble since I've been 10. Didn't like school. I didn't fit in. Mama, she went out late each night and didn't come back. Tell the morning light Never knew where she'd been away But daddy was a cowboy My daddy was a cowboy They say I left home at just 16 Looking for adventure Chasing a dream Long come a man in a pickup truck Cigarette in his mouth and his sleeves rolled up I hopped in and we pulled away Daddy was a cowboy My daddy was a cowboy They say Daddy was a cowboy They say
We move from key to key, and sometimes you forget key you're in here. So, yeah, so that's a fun song to sing, and I'm going to end with another one since I, I wrote one about my dad. Um, really, not about my dad. I've written several about my dad. But this is a real story. So let's take it to narrative that is about me and my family. But again, I did not use I. I use she, third person. I think the third person takes your very personal story and gives it more expansiveness. Other people are going to relate to this story. And I put it in the third person, and you're going to say, I think I know people like this. And that's why I often prefer the third person. It doesn't matter if it was my mom and dad involved in this. It matters the story. It matters that this is something that my dad told me. When I said, Dad, I found this picture of Mom after she passed away. I've never seen this before. Where did this picture come from? And uh, he told me where the picture came from, and I wrote the story. Thank you very much. She wore a blue dress with the white collar. It brought out the darkness of her eyes. Young and sweet and eager and trying hard to please, she forgot it was to be a surprise. Soon to be married, they went driving into town. He said, there's an errand I must, she said, there's an errand I must run. He said, sure, no problem, I'll just sit and read the paper, and I'll be waiting for you when you're done. She caught her reflection in the drugstore window, paused a moment, checked her lipstick for smears. Then posed for the camera, lips parted, smiling shyly, a gift for her lover through the years. She wore a blue dress with the white collar. It brought out the darkness of her eyes. Young and sweet and eager and trying hard to please, she forgot it was to be a surprise. She opened up the car door, sidled over, squeezed his arm, her deeds still dancing in her eyes. Then, without thinking, she just blurted out the story. She forgot it was to be a surprise. When champagne's uncorked, those bubbles just start rising. How could she suppress a thing so grand? She blushed when she remembered it was meant to be a secret until she had that photo in her hand. Sixty years later, he recalls it all with laughter, trying hard to blink back the tears. An empty chair, a presence gone, all that's left's a photograph, a gift for her lover through the years. She wore a blue dress with a white collar. It brought out the darkness of her eyes. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it was a, one of those touching things when you're looking at, at memories. And